for it. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Lacey here with the Fly Like You Stole a YouTube channel here. Hey, I'm over here with Red Tag Shad Morris from uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. We're sitting over here in a B-29, the super fortress over here that Shad happens to be uh, in the process of preparing the airplane for the show season coming up. That's right. Yeah, we're getting ready to get her get her on out of the barn and get it in the air and uh, get around selling rides to all the good people around here that likes to support us and wants to see a really cool airplane and just like Kevin said you're sitting with us in the world's only flying B-29 Super Fortress. Quite an honor. It's an honor to get to work on it and fly it and uh, tour with the airplane and uh, say thanks and pay homage to a bunch of brave men and women that went before us so we wouldn't have to some days. Kind of the way I look at it. It's a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Quite an airplane. There you go. Okay, so Shad, you're right here working in your old Fort Worth today, and uh, you're working on the airplane here. What all kind of maintenance do you guys have to do here during the winter time for the show season, the upcoming show season? Yeah, well, every winter, I mean, just like any other airplane, we got to annual the thing, and the thing is so massive and uh, so many things to do. It takes a full-time crew of three, and uh, generally two other guys that are hired full-time for the three-month, uh, three-month winter maintenance. I try to come down for a few months myself. Uh, Pull the props, run compression on uh, four engines with 18 cylinders each. Uh, jack the airplane up, pull the wheels off of it, redo the bearings, check the brakes, man, you name it. Uh, pedal static, uh, and just a general going through the airplane, going through and seeing things maybe we don't like or some nitpicky things we didn't get caught up on last year that we just want to look nicer. Uh, you got it. It's a uh, it's just a labor of love. It's never ending, and sometimes you wonder how we won the war with this stuff because you're always working on it. But it, it's just it's just the way it was back then, you know. And the, the thing burns 400 gallons of gas every hour. How many gallons of oil does it burn? Uh, usually, we get about a gallon and a half per engine per hour, and that's pretty good. Wow, that's that, that's good. a lot of oil. I thought my Taylor Craft burning one quart an hour was pretty bad, that's but right. uh, yeah. this is. Uh, that takes quite a bit of funding there to keep that uh, keep that engine fed with oil and gas, right? It certainly does. Every engine has an 85-gallon oil tank. And we even have a centerline oil tank that holds 185 gallons, and we can service those engines remotely. Oh, from without, while you're flying? We could if you wanted to, but our hops are always so short, we just do it on the ground. Oh, okay. You know? Well, Shad, I understand that the old B-29's original engine was, uh, was susceptible to lots of failures with that. I guess it was a twin spool or something or another, but I uh, don't remember all the nomenclature or what they called it all. But uh, how about describing the new engines that we've got on here and how that differs from the original engines? Sure, yeah, without, without getting into it too deep, um, the difference between the original engine and this engine, that original engine, they're both 3,350 cubic inches. That was the first run of the 3350 was on the B-29, and later, you know, they perfected it in the Sky Raider, the C-119 flying boxcar, very reliable engine. Uh, the crazy thing about the first engine was that uh, the, the front cylinders, the exhaust, ducted out the front to a collectoring in the front. So you got this big 1,500-degree heater in front of an air-cooled engine. Didn't oh. make sense. You know, I think the, magne the the cranks and the cases were pure magnesium, so if they ever had a fire... Oh, well, you ever had an exhaust leak, you're going to have a... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you're going to get it going, and you ain't getting the fire out, and the overheating was a problem. Of course, they flew out of Tinian in the South Pacific. Hot, you know, density altitudes in the five or 6,000-foot yeah, range. Yeah, hot and humid, right? Oh, yeah, you know, and a 144,000-pound airplane on a 6,000-foot strip, you know, and it was wide open, and... Hope that they uh, hope that they didn't. You know that was the Achilles' heel of the whole program was the engine. Now, the engine that we have now is a hybrid. It's basically three sections of different dash number 3350s. Uh, uh, we've got the original power section. The accessory section in the back is basically from a Sky Raider, and uh, without all the numbers and stuff, the nose nose gear reduction gear is from a C119 flying mm -hmm. boxcar. Flying boxcar. Yeah. Right. So it makes it makes a good reliable engine. The the, en the engines and the airplane is now more or less up to par. Oh. You know, and that's just something that they never fully worked out during the war. And of course, then the war was over, so it was a, it was non event. Nobody's going to be flying them anymore. All so. right, now as I recall, when you guys were, when the engine changes were being done on this originally, uh, wasn't there a, an issue with uh, certification for the engines because they originally weren't even on the airplane to begin with? Uh, not not particularly. There could have been. There could have been, but being in an experimental category, you know, that pretty much took care of that. Mm. Uh, that was pretty, you know, it was really, really a non-event. So uh, um, our, our friends there in Wichita that are trying to get a B-29 flying dock, they have the same engine set up. We've been, 
we've been glad to, to lend them experience and knowledge that we have because we want to see them succeed. It's a, it may be a friendly rivalry, of course, but we want to see those guys succeed. That's a lot of work. That's quite a, that's quite a goal. I mean, well, 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 I understand the ambition at this point in time is to have Fifi, this one here, this B-29 here that you're working on, and uh, Doc, the B-29 that's in Wichita, to be able to fly a formation up at Oshkosh this summer. Uh, late end of July. Uh, you think that's going to be a possibility? Well, it's all, it all depends on the guys in Wichita. I don't know exactly how far along they are. Um, and you know how it is, right when you think you're done, you still got 90% left. <laughs> you know, it just never fails. You always got something else that's going to delay you and going to delay you. But yeah, to see, see two B-29s flying in the air for the first time since World War II, I think that would be that would be awesome, and I think it would be great for the air show public. Uh, be awesome for the for the vets, and once again for those those brave men and women that you know fought and went before me and you. So we would have to someday. That's what we do. Well, that's a that's a good thing there. And uh, at this point in time, we're sitting in the cockpit of this thing, and it's pretty massive up here. And I'm going to try to walk around the airplane here now, and maybe go to the flight engineers panel. Sure. And, and uh, just take a look at the airplane and see what I can show you guys here in the low light of the uh, dungeon at Fort Worth Meacham over here. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of dark in here, but right now we're sitting up in the very, very nose section of the airplane. Yep. I'm not sure what these guys do sitting up here, but I'm guessing this is where the guy with the bomb site is. And yep. he figures out where to drop the bombs there that this airplane's carrying. And uh, like I said, I'm not sure about all this stuff because this is not the world I came from. <laughs> you know, we, we can talk about a Falcon or a Learjet all day long, and yep. uh, I'm pretty, pretty uh, versed on those. But here we are in the old Warbirds. Yeah, that's the that's the that's the bombardier's position right there, and that is the top secret Norden bomb site, the most uh, closely guarded secret during the war at one time. Ain't and that a trip? It is. Yeah, this airplane. Uh, he could actually fly the airplane through the autopilot with the, or excuse me, through the bomb site via the autopilot. And uh, there's a bunch of whiz bang monkey motion stuff in there that corrects for wind drift, altitude, and everything is supposed to put the supposed to put the bomb right in the pickle barrel from 30,000 feet. And they did it, did it quite well. Oh uh, well, that's yeah. that's pretty entertaining. I'm gonna go back over sure. here now and look at this flight engineer panel because right there's a lot of cool stuff on this one. Sure I may have to grab the light stand over here so I can show you guys what this thing looks like. Oh, that looks complicated, doesn't it? Look at all them whistles and bells and knobs and buttons and switches. How you guys like that? Hey, the guy's even got a window to look out of. Yep, it's got a lot going on there. Yeah, well, so what do you do here? You manage the engines, the uh, fuel mixtures, and the propellers? Yep. Is that what you're sitting here essentially doing? Yeah, the flight engineer runs the entire airplane. The pilots just point it. That's all they do. Oh, no, the pilot just points they the airplane. They just point it in the sky. Every, all the magic happens back here from startup to cruise to descents, uh, maneuvers. Uh, all your all your airframe and engine emergencies are all handled right here. Uh, mm -hmm. You name it, it has to go through here before it can happen. It has to go through the engineer. Well, now, let me see if I understand this, Chad. This thing has operated uh, the flight controls uh, or the flaps and the landing gear and the gear, the bomb bay doors. They're actually hydraulically operated, right? No, this whole, this whole airplane is electric. Oh, is that fact? That's right. Yeah, the... the, the uh, Even the brakes? Yep. Yeah. Well, the, the brakes are hydraulic. That's the only hydraulic component on the airplane is the brakes. All right. Well, yep. that's kind of cool. Uh, electric, that's pretty inter interesting because yep. no, I wouldn't have thought that. Yeah. Thing has a six six uh, three hundred amp generators plus one two hundred amp auxiliary in the back, so we can make lots of electricity. Well, I'm not sure where we're at right here in the airplane now. It looks like it'd be the radio radio operator yep. station of some sort. You're right. And would this be navigation or would this be uh... this radio? This is just the radio man right here. All he did was communicate with uh, everybody there was to communicate with. Kind of kind of neat thing about these radios here. We have had a. Uh, a retired gentleman from Collins Avionics that got the original style uh, equipment, got them working, installed in the airplane, and when he's flying with us, he'll be talking via shortwave to people in Australia, Japan, all over the place. Really cool, really neat. Oh, wow. Who the yeah. fuck of a B-29, yeah. an airplane that's uh, how many years old is this now, 60 years old? Uh, built in 1944. Well, okay then. So there you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sixty-year-old airplane sitting here, seventy years or something. Yep. My math. I'm, I went to public education, so my math is probably not that good. Ain't nothing but thing. Anyhow, I'm guessing this is an aggravation or navigation channel. This is nav there. navigator. Yeah, navigator. And uh, if you can imagine, uh, back in the days when there was no GPS, there was not even a Loran. If anybody knows what Loran is, there, was, there wasn't, didn't even have that. Uh, it was all through dead reckoning pilotage. Uh, shooting stars, shooting the sun, and uh, this here is you know coming over the desert, roar, in the in the Pacific, you know over the over the water for 18 hours at a time, with no landmarks. 
I just I don't know how they did it. They they it, hit it every time. I'm 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 certain that this is not how they uh, shoot at the enemy. I'm nope. guessing that's a flare gun. It is a flare pistol. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, they use it different different colors significant uh, was significant for different events. Whether it be form up, uh, red flares were emergency priority land. Uh, a lot of neat stories when you hear from different crewmen over the years about their flare gun and what colors did this and what colors did that and. Uh huh. And, uh, or what it was supposed to alert other people what to. What it was supposed to do, yeah. All On this right. map right here, one cool thing I want to point out that's Dutch Van Kirk. That's his signature. He was the last surviving member of the Atomic Mission, the Enola Gay, August 6, 1945. And had the privilege of flying Mr. Van Kirk in this airplane at Oshkosh two years ago. And uh, I have to say, as uh, far as uh, what little little bit of flying career I got, that was right up there at the top. Uh -huh. That was really, he was a really neat guy, just a gentleman in every aspect, and it was really an honor to have him here. All right. Well, cool. Well, uh, you know, right now I'm not sure where I'm at, but I'm looking at a crawl space down through here, and I'm not sure if I can get a light down through here. Yeah, but like, what goes yeah, what, what what goes on down here? That's I, the tunnel. I, I that's see the, a I see a table sitting back there. Yep, that's the famous B29 tunnel right there. This was a pressurized airplane. Mm. But a lot of people don't know it was pressurized in three compartments. We're in the first compartment where the flight crew stood, and you'll notice a hemispherical bulkhead right there. Uh, just just like any other pressure vessel, that's mm -hmm. what it is. When there was a tunnel that connected the second or number two pressurized uh, area of the airplane. And would that be back in the back past the Bombay? Yep, yep. yep. Aft crew members sat back there. They had a small galley. They had uh, they had uh, bunks and uh, they had their crew stations. They had they were of course there were gunners and later in the war were, were uh, the the uh, radar a radar navigator sat back there too. Hmm. Back in the day. All right. Well, this is kind of cool. Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to jump out of the airplane and do a walk around on the outside Let's here real quick, and we'll see what we can find over there. In the meantime, we'll be right back. Sounds fun.